Welcome and thank you for joining us for our Disability Power Series featuring Riva Lair and Sandy Yee. This is Riva Jag Rifkin speaking, I'm Riva. I'm the Director of Civic Engagement and Marketing for Disability Lead. My pronouns are she, her, her, and an image description of me is that I am a brown woman with dark brown, long, curly, darkish, curly hair. I'm wearing a green sweater and a chunky, multi-strand pearl necklace with gold hoop earrings. In my virtual, oops, in my virtual background is just a blurred, pretty neutral screen. We sent out a guide on accessing key accessibility features in Zoom today, and we have CART, ASL interpreter, and Spanish translation available. If you have any challenging, challenging accessing these features, please connect with us in the chat box, and they can all be selected from the bottom menu bar in your screen. Thank you for joining again this afternoon, including so many of our Disability Lead members, and of course, those who have donated to support the accessibility of this program. And also for those of you who have been waiting like we have been for almost six months. If you are a person with a disability living in the Chicago region and are interested in joining our community, I invite you to visit disabilitylead.org slash apply to become a member. Or if you're interested in becoming a fellow, those applications will be opening over the summer for 2023. Can't believe I just said that. All participants today are in attendee mode only, but we encourage you to engage with us uh, and follow along with great questions. On but we, we will also be opening up the Q&A feature uh, about halfway through our program. I will be taking questions from the Q&A feature and from those pre-submitted. So feel free to use that Q&A feature to submit any additional questions you might have. And with that, I'm thrilled to go off camera and invite Sandy on camera, who will be sharing her phenomenal work with us. Uh, today, we will be discussing Sandy's work and Reva's work. Uh, each of them will have about seven to eight minutes to present their, their work. Uh, and then we'll come back to three of us for a conversation together. And then again, we'll turn it over to your question. And I will say that Riva is running a few minutes late, but we hope that she will be able to join us by the time Sandy is done with her presentation. So Sandy, if you're with us, please come on video. Thank you. And I will turn off mine. Hello everyone, this is Sandy speaking. I go by she and her. An image description of myself would be, um, I am a Taiwanese with light um, tanned slash somehow, sometimes people say olive um, color skin tone and I have long black hair. Um, in the background, I have some plants and a little um, wheelchair, um, toy size wheelchair in the back. Um, so on the slides, I have um, two images of uh, my work. Um, this work, it was called Refuse, R-E, there's a dash, and Fuse. So this work was about um, talking, um, basically having a conversation with myself, like what did the medical intervention mean to me when I was born? I My fingers were fused together and I had operation. So um, I have always wanted to do something about my scars. So in this piece, um, I put my arms, um, I mean, not my arms, my wrists um, resting on top of each other. And um, I have um, a tailor made um, plastic based um, and latex um, hand piece that I am wearing in this picture. And I um, also a, um, a brief um, like undies with two big white framed cutouts um, featuring um, the scars that I have on my pelvic bone. And um, the second picture kind of shows the view from the side where I have my hands kind of like propped back um, holding my waist and you can see more stitches on there. So in this piece, I was really thinking about um, is the medical model all bad? And um, so um, back then I did not have um, 
a lot of um, knowledge from disability studies, but the conversation was always within myself, like, well, it actually helped me to gain finer motor skills. And, um, but um, it's complicated because Oftentimes people focus on like what's wrong with you and how do we fix you? How do we help you? So in this piece, I was really um, having a dialogue with myself and thinking about what it means to um, not live like either or medical model or social model. Next. And in this picture, um, a, a Caucasian model rests both of her hands on her hips. She wears a coral collared skirt and the beige um, bandeau, which is um, a piece of fabric that covers the breast area. And um, a part of the white L-shaped wrist braces cradles her, cradles her wrists, which naturally curve inwards. Her fingers curve and rest gently next to each other. The L-shaped braces have a hard surface, but with organic wavy edges close to the model's hand. The model's forearm are cupped in soft, uh, with soft and creamy fabric embroidered with clusters of white and pinkish French knots. So these are the little tiny ball-shaped stitches that I made. Um, so in this piece, I work with uh, my dear friend who is also a disabled painter, Sonora Taylor, and um, Sunny and I were just talking about what it means to um, redefine what is norm, what is healthy, what is beautiful for us. Um, next. In um, this picture, I have four images. They are all like close-up pictures showing you the details of um, the braces that I created for Sunny. Um, so having a conversation about um, what were the things that the medical professions wanted you to do um, or the things that people believe that it should be normal that was done to you. Um, in Sunny's case that um, she had to wear uh, like braces to straighten her wrist. And in the conversation that I had with her was like, what would be the most comfortable position that you would rather be in with your wrist? And she said, oh, shape. So that's why I created this piece to, as a, a containment to hold our stories and then also hold her desire for being in her own body. Next piece, please. So there are three pen. Else, each contains small sacks made with transparent, also silky fabric. The shapes of the sacks um, vary organically. There are tiny, there are tiny pieces of human skin flakes inside each of the sacks. They are embroidered with red salmon colors and white threads. Um, so in my work, I um, often. Um, focus on the narratives that my um, disabled siblings and I have. And in this piece, I work with disability rights um, activist, Rani Patrick, R-A-H-N-E-E, -E, and Patrick, P-A-T-R-I-C-K. Um, so Rani and I share um, a connection based on, um, you know, she was the first, um, um, Asian American with disabilities that I know of. So for me, it was like, wow, I finally found my family. And on top of that, we talk about how our bodies are shaped because our our disability, particularly our fingers and toes. And I work as a personal assistant um, for Rani and um, just wanna explain that I am um, in Chicago Loop. so the train is going past by and it may be covering some of my voice. So if I did not make myself clear, um, I'd be happy to provide more exp explanations later. Um, so back to this piece, um, Rani and I, um, I work for her as a personal assistant from time to time. And um, so, um, and her experience is she collect, um, she, her skin grows a hundred times faster than average people. So during our care sessions, the interactions that I have with her um, may look like, oh, it's just like caring for one another in terms of um, um, dressing and um, um, getting ready um, 
for lotion and stuff like that. But for us, this connection like between Crip siblings, C-R-I-P, Crip siblings, Crip sisters, um, is about creating a space where we can hold the existence of our bodies. And next slide, you can see a detail um, you can see a detailed picture of the skin flakes inside the sacks and some of the flakes appear to be more like yellowish and um, the sacks itself looks like a, a white cloud and there are several pieces in this image. The last image I have for you are um, two images featuring the same piece. Um, they're strips of olive green felt fabric. They gathered, um, one of them is, they gathered diagonally on a white surface and each of them were cut with hand shapes modeled um, after my two finger hands. So each strip ends with like large two finger hands and then um, there are like smaller two finger hands are cut randomly on their sides. Um, and I worked with um, Sins Invalid on this piece called Help, um, Kelp Help, K-E-L-P, Kelp Help. And I'd be happy to um, tell you all more about it when we go into um, conversations with Risa and um, Reba. Thank you. This is Risa and Sandy. Thank you so much for sharing your art with us and it's so powerful. Um, I can't wait to get into more conversation with you, but at this time, Reba, you are here. Uh, please uh, come off of mute. Thank you and introduce yourself and uh, your slides are starting now for you to describe your art with us. Ah, well, um, hi everyone. Uh, forgive me for being late. It's been, it's been a very crypt day. <laughs> many, many body uh, issues. So anyway, <clears throat> I'm really happy to be here with, uh, with Sandy who, Chicago is incredibly lucky that she decided to stay here. Um, and listening to her talk about her work, uh, I realized that besides a deep concern with the body and with um, trying to figure out what we found beautiful in the realm of things that we are told are the very definition of the unbeautiful, we also uh, share um, a real commitment to intimacy. Um, mine is my way of doing that is different um, than what Sandy does. Hers is much more tactilely immediate. Um, what I do, so I'm sorry, I should have described myself first. Um, I um, am a short disabled woman who is currently 63. I have, um, I'm white. I have kind of very white hair streaked with <clears throat> with a uh, bright red, which is chosen red. I'm a chosen redhead. Uh, I'm wearing a black shirt, uh, a button up black shirt with big gold hoop earrings and inside the little hoop earrings. Sorry. <coughs> you may not be able to see our um, little hands, which I wore in honor of Sandy. I know that they're not as beautifully shaped as hers, but it's my homage to Sandy. Um, so what I do is I, people call me a portrait artist. I have figured out that what I am is an artist who is trying to understand embodiment through the medium of portraiture. So I'm an artist who's trying to understand embodiment through the act of portraiture and through making portraiture a specifically ethically structured form of engagement that addresses how we're treated as disabled people and as queer people and as anyone who is continually told that they are other. My deep interest, you know, it's rooted in disability, but I've come to also understand that what I really am concerned with is stigma and how people live under stigma. So when I first started doing portraits um, <clears throat> in 1997, uh, I, up until then, 
I hated being disabled. I was totally ashamed. I, I write about, um, I have a, a book out, um, I'll show you later. But in the book, I write about the fact that for years, I would walk around with my glasses off and just to show you what my prescription's like, um, I'm holding my glasses up to the lens and you can see that the lenses are very distorting. So it's a thick prescription. I would walk around without my glasses on so that I couldn't see myself because I was so horrified by even seeing myself in a shop window that I couldn't endure it. And then I had the great luck in 97 to be pulled into something called the um, Chicago Disabled Artists Collective that was uh, included um, Mike Irvin and Techie Lemnicki, Susan Nussbaum, who is the one who dragged me in, Alana Wallace, um, uh, Anna Stonem, um, Jeff Carpenter, Bill Shannon, um, I'm sure I'm blanking, but it was quite a remarkable group of people. And what they did, and what, what I'm guessing Sandy would resonate with, is that besides telling me that there was art about disability and that there was humor and that you could dress snappy, which they did, which I loved, what they really gave me was analysis. Um, up until that point, and I think this is something a lot of disabled people deal with, is we are, we're just swimming in our life. We're being flooded by all these terrible messages and, and ways that we're treated and, and boatloads of shame. And, you know, we're just kind of in it, trying to survive it. And until, at least for me, until you find people who can help you back up and look at what's really going on here, what's happening politically and historically and aesthetically, so that you can kind of take the, the crap of your life and get a hold of it and take it apart and, and see what the forces are behind how you've been raised, how you've been treated. So that's what they did for me. And so when I started doing portraits, one of the things I realized in the collective is that the one thing that really bound us all together, um, whatever our impairment was, was that as soon as it became, you know, if we were visibly disabled or if we had a, a performative disability that would suddenly make itself known, that as soon as we were identifiably disabled, that we would get stared at. We'd get comments, but we would get stared at. I mean, it was like everyone all of a sudden was trying to diagnose us and then asking questions, explicitly asking to diagnose us. And so when I decided to ask people to sit for me, I realized that they were gonna be carrying this hard, hard history of being stared at, looked at in a way that hurt, right? It hurt. So now I'm gonna what? Ask them to sit in a room and let me stare at them? So the way that I came up with an acceptable method, or I hoped what would be acceptable, is that I immediately started giving people power over how they were going to be represented. Um, I interviewed people for a long time. I disclosed a lot of stuff about myself, so it wasn't a one-way street. And we would work on little thumbnails taken from the stories that they told me. And then I would show them the thumbnail sketch, little sketch, and say, does this seem truthful to you? Is this how you'd like to be seen? And then we would alter it and alter it. And then finally, the person would come and sit for me. And for me, the studio is intensely intimate. Nobody else is allowed in when we're working together. Um, I've done a couple public studios, but they're very controlled about when people are allowed to come in. And I never ask anyone to do anything that they're uncomfortable with. So right now up on the screen is a large charcoal black and white drawing of uh, someone who many of you may be familiar with, um, a woman named Nomi Lam, N-O-M-Y-L-A-M-M. -M. She, I met her originally in Chicago. She was here studying at an alternative 
Jewish yeshiva. And since then, she's gone off to Oakland and is now, I believe, the artistic director of Sins and Ballad that Sandy mentioned. But when I met her, she was mainly a singer, a performance artist and a singer. So I, each story behind, the story behind each piece is long and intense. Uh, there's text on my website. There's text in my book. My book exists both as a physical hardback, paperback, audiobook, and ebook. And in the audiobook, we have audio descriptions of each piece. So for anyone who has low or no vision, um, you can experience this, uh, you know, in a fully described form. But in this piece, <clears throat> um, Nomi is suspended in water. Um, she's wearing a swimsuit. She's, she's a white woman who is, uh, I will say fat because she is a fat activist. Um, her pigtails are floating up towards the surface. Her mouth is open. She is gesturing with her hands and swimming with her um, upside down is a large leopard seal. And there are air bubbles coming from the seal's mouth and blending with the bubbles coming from Nomi's mouth because we were talking about how in our imagination we have images and heroes and objects that when we're really like knocked sideways, we can turn to those things to kind of help us remember who we are. So Nomi, um, if one, uh, looks down towards the sort of right-hand corner of the image, um, you will see that Nomi has taken off her prosthetic leg and is swimming with the, um, the sock that amputees wear uh, between their, their prosthetic and their flesh. So the whole thing makes this very kinetic shape. It's one of my favorite drawings. Uh, next. This is from the same series called Totems and Familiars. This is a large drawing of Lynn Manning. Lynn Manning was uh, an African, a black man who grew up in uh, the Watts area of Los Angeles. He originally was a sculptor. Um, he was shot and blinded in a bizarre attack when he was in his, I believe, late twenties. And again, there's a long story behind this. And after he lost his vision, <clears throat> he reinvented himself. And that, you know, that's what we do, right? We're, that's what being disabled is so much about is constant reinvention, constant learning that you can't hold on to the old ways of doing things. You know, they're always temporary, but Lynn's reinvention was spectacular. He um, went, he became the blind judo champion several years running, I think, in the Paralympics. He then uh, became a sculptor. Uh, he'd been a painter. He became a sculptor. But most primarily, he became an actor and a poet whose work was powerful, doesn't do it justice. And then he went on to found the Watts Village Theater in L.A. He was a co-founder of the Village Theater. So Lynn became just tremendously influential and, and again, you know, being kind enough to sit for me. Um, I do wanna say one extra thing about this piece. I mentioned that we would work from little sketches. So, you know, people would tell me stories and I would do versions of them and then show them and then we would alter them. But because Lynn had no vision, I couldn't do that. And my work is always based in ethics. So what I decided, what we came up with was that I would, um, once he went back to LA and I continued working on his portrait, that I would send photos to LA via email, to his email. He would show them to his wife and to his friends who would tell him what they looked like. They would discuss it and then tell me whether or not Lynn thought that perhaps something should change. So we came up again with an alternate method that, you know, at first I was stymied, like, how can I do this if I can't show my collaborator the working uh, materials, but we figured it out. 
And um, in this image, in, Lynn is uh, shirtless, although he was wearing pants. Um, he, it's a two-part drawing. In the lower drawing, he is holding up his white cane right down the middle of his face. And on his skin, you, well, first off, you can see his beautiful musculature, but you can also see these gorgeous stripes that are um, stretch marks like pregnant women get. Pregnant women get them because the skin stretches past the point of stability and starts to have these little micro ruptures. The same thing apparently, I didn't know this, happened to um, weightlifters and, and you know people who are extremely muscular. So for Lynn, he, it's like he's a tiger because he's beautiful, just kind of contour stripes running down his arms. Next, and that was from 2009. Um, and I, forgive me, I don't remember how many slides I have. So um, go a little faster. Uh, this is a self-portrait from 2016. Um, it's called 66 degrees, which has to do with the angle of my scoliosis, which I never say, but it's us together. <laughs> so I'm gonna tell you guys, I never say this to mainstream audiences, but 66 degrees was the angle of my scoliosis that year when they measured me. And I'm standing nude to the waist in a green pond at night. And my arms are raised almost like I'm going to fly away um, kind of up and behind me. Uh, there are streams of water pour, pouring, <clears throat> pouring all around me. Um, I am painted in Caucasian flesh tones with my red and white hair. The pond is luminous green and draped around my body is a gold evening gown, which is sort of floating partly on the water and coming apart in the water. Um, next slide. This, okay, so when the pandemic hit, you will be unsurprised to hear, I couldn't have anybody in my studio anymore. You know, I couldn't do that physical intimacy. I, as many of us, have some pretty intense vulnerabilities that it, where I, <clears throat> to get COVID, it would be extremely dangerous. So I flailed for a few weeks. Oh my God, this is the end of my career. And then I thought, no, I'm going to, I'm going to start drawing people over Zoom. So I asked, I started asking people to sit for me where I could see them in my laptop. And the first person that I wanted to work with was our spectacular sister, um, Alice Wong, who for anyone who may not know who Alice is, she is uh, an Asian American, I think Chinese American uh, activist based in the Bay Area. Um, she is one of our most public voices for disability rights and everything, justice, culture, medical justice. She is ferocious and brilliant. And she is the one who came up with, came out with that book, um, Oh my God, Sandy, you'll know the title. I am old and I lose words. Uh, hey, Lisa, this is Lisa, Disability, Disability. Disability. And Disability. this is your last slide, just so you know. A huge, thank you. A huge, um, really important collection of essays by a lot of uh, prominent and emerging disability writers. Um, so Alice and I sat for like six weeks on and off on Zoom, I got to know her much better. Um, she, in this image, she is drawn on translucent plastic mylar to give a little bit of the feeling of, um, of, of the surface of a laptop. Um, she is uh, in this um, image, sort of pale golden skin, stark black hair pulled back in a ponytail. Um, there's a, a sort of a line drawing of the back of her wheelchair behind her. She's wearing her uh, BiPAP, which gives her her oxygen support. So that comes off um, to the side. I loved drawing that, the translucence 
and the elegance of that form. It was wonderful. It's, it's that disability beauty thing. I, I just thought it was gorgeous. And then she's wearing this black and white tracksuit where the white stripes of the tracksuit um, top kind of play with the curve of her wheelchair and her BiPAP. And very much at the bottom, um, you can't really see it, but there's handwritten notes about our, our exchanges. Um, and there's a line drawing of her apartment right behind her. Um, Alice is done in full color and everything else is pretty much in black and white. I think that's my last slide, I hope. Okay. This is Lisa, Lisa, it was, and that was such a phenomenal um, sharing of your incredible work. Um, at this time, I'm gonna invite Sandy to come join us on screen as we uh, do a little bit of a conversation and then remind the audience, I see you sending such uh, powerful remarks in the chat. If you have any questions, please drop them in the Q&A for our wonderful speaker today. Um, and then I think Robin, just a little housekeeping note, I think Robin will be dropping in the chat a reminder that there is captioning ASL interpretation and Spanish interpretation available. If you have any questions about those, Please chat up. Uh, with that. I'm going to ask Sandy and Riva a, power, a, a question about power. We always start our conversation together and are talking about power because it is a disability power series after all. I think you both claim power by powerfully, and I know I'm saying power a lot, by powerfully controlling and cha challenging the narrative around your disability as you both shared in talking about your art through your art. Why is it important to claim power? How do we claim power? And especially for those of us who experience marginalized identities. Uh, Sandy, do you wanna go first? Sure, this is Sandy speaking. Um, so when I create art, I actually, I did not consider myself like, oh, I have power. Um, I think um, it's only something that I think or reflect on later. But, you know, the idea of power, it does not mean that you always have to feel like strong and positive and optimistic about things. And um, But I think that I do define like the energy or maybe power, the energy that I get to create when I share conversations with my um, disabled siblings, that energy is something that keeps me going. So maybe it's a form of power. But for me, I think about um, the relationship that we get to build together with one another. Um, it's the core value and the strength. Um, that I feel like I am lucky to, um, in a way, inherit from my disability community. To be honest, I don't think in terms of power. Um, and my mind always goes to more political things, um, things that, that create sort of immediate structural change. Not that art doesn't. I mean, I work a lot with um, museums and granting organizations and uh, residencies and stuff in the last few years to get them to be aware of the needs of artists with disabilities. Um, if they're going to invite them in, they need to understand uh, the context. Um, I think that's the place where I feel like I'm the most sort of directly powerful. Um, for instance, years ago, I worked with uh, the NEA. I think the first time I worked with the NEA, I was talking to them about the problem of grant applications. And that for artists, a lot of times when you apply for a grant, they will say, <clears throat> please apply with your last two years of work, or please apply with your last four years of work. And for many of us, that's ridiculous because we might have a very productive year and then a couple of years where we're 
really not well or we're in and out of the hospital or something. And then we start picking up our practice again. And for someone who has been able-bodied and able to be productive all those four years, we're not gonna look very impressive. So that was one like immediate change that I was able to do in several you know, major grants for them to um, uh, really reconsider the, the timeline, the time parameters for work. But I think power, um, here's a problem. <laughs> I'm so contrary. I've been doing book launch or book events now since October of 20, when my book came out. And the able-bodied world really wants to see me as powerful, as someone who's like overcome and um, a survivor and we don't know how you do it. And I get very irritated because I want to think about aesthetics and intimacy and trust and finding in yourself those delicate places where honesty comes from and risk. And so when I feel like I'm being framed as a uh, Joan of Arc or something, the secret Jew, <laughs> It, it, it makes me crazy, so um, or it disturbs me. So it's a hard thing to answer. I want to make change. I want to make structural change. But in the studio, what I'm doing in the studio is not about that. What I do outside the studio as an advisor or a public speaker, it's closer to that. This is Lisa, and I appreciate the challenge to the concept of power. You know, I I think as someone who is disabled myself, the power that I see between the two of you, and I hope you're noticing in the chat how many people are saying you are some of the most um, admired artists in Chicago. I can't see the chat. Okay, <laughs> well, I, I will I... read some of it for you soon, and I'll send it to you after the event, but just complimenting you and your work and your work today and you know, really appreciating the value of sharing the collective disabled story. Um, I want to ask about the connection between both of you and your work. You know, I see your work being so connected, you know, Reba between your studio work, between Gollum Girl, and then also Sandy, just in the pieces that you you shared with us today. You know, um, you're both activists, you're both educators as well. And, you know, your understanding of the disability experience, I feel like mirrors each other in so many ways, um, but it's unique, right? We all have our own stories as well. Um, how do you see each other's work paralleling and diverging from each other? And I know you're, you're longtime friends as well. So really curious how you see, you know, your work uh, being connected to one another. So I met Riva back in 2006 um, at the Disability Arts and Culture Festival um, organized by Body Self Work, Network of Disability Art and Culture. Um, I did not know <laughs> disabled people, disabled artists specifically. And um, um, during that festival, I came out as a disabled person. Um, the experience was very much like what Riva described earlier when she was showing her work like running into these cool people and then like, oh, I don't have to explain my disability anymore, but they get it. And they talk to me about the artistic choices I made in my art. And it's not about like avoiding disability or rejecting disability, um, but like what, um, it's more like what my uh, mentor, Carrie Sandolf had said, it's about um, you know disability flavors, like if it flavors the conversation, it flavors the thing that we do as artists, um, or it's like part of our style. And so I was really excited that I get to hang out with these cool people. Um, and of course, a part of me was pretty frightened because um, I didn't think that I could have these communities. 
So in many ways, I have always looked up to Viva, and I just remember uh, right before I go for Taiwan, um, Riva told me that, you know, like, just tell your stories, just, you know, just focus on who you are. You're not trying to convince people. You're not trying to, you know, like, make them believe in anything, um, but just be who you are. So that really stayed with me. And, um, and I, um, I do feel honored if people see like, oh, there are like parallels between your work and Viva and then just feel like, oh, like she's my, my star. <laughs> um, but I think that her work, Viva, your work has helped me to see um, the images that I wish I saw earlier in my life. I know that Riva can probably talk more about this, how disabled people are not represented in the fine arts world, not in the way that we would like. And I think I also want to connect this to like the question of what is what is powerful. And I think what's powerful about us creating disability art is it encompasses um, all aspects, including, you know, the vulnerable aspect um, in, includes pain. It includes maybe there are days that I just don't want to do anything, and and it's it's really about like not trying to um, convince the um, the non-disabled world about our value, and um, I think it's about naming things and. Um, have an agency and um, yeah so I do find like earlier on like my work was about trying to convince people that I am capable I can do this I can do things just as well as um, people with five fingers but I think the more and the longer that I am in disability community and disability art community, I feel like I am making art for my people. Um, so a lot of time it matters more like, I wanna share my work. And it's very much like how I'm seeing that Riva is creating work about disability and, and we get to own that together as a community. Um. When I first met Sandy, um, she told me some pretty harrowing stories, which I won't repeat, but about how she was treated as a young woman, uh, a teenager and a young woman in Taiwan. And um, and I think in the mainland too. I No, okay, I couldn't remember. Um, things that broke my heart. And then I saw in front of me this woman who had come through that and had found her way to, um, it can't have been easy with the kind of messages that you got to step into something like the Disability Art and Culture Festival. That must have taken a pretty deep breath. And yet right from the beginning, your work was so poetic. And that's what really killed me um, was that, you know, I've seen a lot of, young artists and emerging artists um, start to deal with impairment. But your work right from the beginning was very assured and very poetic. And I think it's continued that way. Um, I think that sometimes technique, I mean, you touch on an interesting thing. I think one of the reasons my technique is so obsessive is either various reasons, but I think partly it's to prove, oh, look, I can do things. I can do something well. And your work is very beautifully crafted. And I think that there's a bridge there between us of like craft as this way of sort of seeking dignity or parity or something. I mean, we love it for its own sake, but it also produces a kind of unexpected O oh in, our, in our audience, which is too bad really, but um, that, that it has to be like, oh, you can do this. But, but I think that um, you use that kind of uh, surprise to really good effect. 
Um, and as I said earlier, you know, we're both really concerned with intimacy and trust and community. Um, my, my frustration was that I fell in love with portraiture back when I was in art school in the 1970s and hated that I never saw any images of people like me. It was weird. I mean, yes, I hated it. And then I was also relieved because I hated who I was. It probably would have helped me tremendously if disabled people were shown as beautiful in the history of art, but we weren't. So there was this longing and dread at the same time. So it took me a long time to get past the dread and get to the longing. And I wonder for you, do you have something like that where like, yes, I want it, no, I don't. Yes, I want it, no, I don't. Like in your early work at least. Yeah, this is Sandy speaking again, um, spot on. I was just thinking about how um, I was so scared to take classes in fashion department mm. because I was like, well, I don't know what to do. I mean, I, I started drawing like pretty clothes when I was little and then thought about, I want to be a fashion designer. But I think um, when, as soon as I got into college, I was like, you know, inner beauty matters, right? And so I was really conflicting, like I want to be beautiful, but I think deep inside me, like I couldn't feel that way. And that's how internalized ableism works. It's like, no. And so perhaps I should do something more for the inside. And then I think that was the reason that I didn't go into fashion department and because I was scared. Um, yeah. And then I was also thinking that I did not want to design something beautiful according to like, more like everybody loves this type of beauty. Um, I was not into it. And even though I was not sure what I was looking for, but eventually I think that I was looking for the rawness of disability. And um, so, um, yeah, a lot of times conflicting. It's like, I can say, I did not like the way that people stared at me since I was little. And, but that actually trained me a skill to be very observant. And um, so like Riva pointed out that, yeah, we use these like crafts, we make it work. Um, and perhaps a part of it comes with like, um, the expectations that, oh, you need to show us something that you are good at so we can accept you as valuable beings. But at the same time, I think, you know, I actually do like challenging myself with um, different stitches. And I want to, you know, just like the negative spaces between my hands or, you know, the shape and then how I interact with like tools. It's like, I just love the tactile quality. So it's like, yeah, it is my passion too. Um, and I do push myself hard to, um, you know, when I was making like metalworking and using different um, tools and hammers and each time it is a internal dialogue, like, am I picking up this tool to show people that I can actually do it and coming back to myself, like, why do I have to go through these questions every time? And why are we expected to just like, Approve, approve, like approve, prove, prove. Um, yeah, and then I think later on, it's like, you know what? I'm just gonna focus on the specific concept I am working on. And so I feel like there are a lot of internal dialogues that takes place um, in the art making. This is me, so that was, thank you. I, I'm just gonna jump in because we got some questions that relate to exactly what you're both talking about now. Um, one question of, uh, can you share what habits or rituals you participate in to develop such inner clarity? And we also got a question on how do you fight ableism? But I'm gonna add a little piece to it of, I think, you know, what I'm hearing too, Sandy, of your, your like conflict when you're thinking about what tools and how you create is this potentially 
you know, ableism we hold within ourselves. So I just want to offer if you have anything to add, knowing those other questions, or Riva, if you wanted to continue that discussion. So uh, the question is, how do you fight ableism? Is yeah, that... but I was just picking up, and I feel like Sandy was addressing, you know, this ableism that sometimes we carry in, in ourselves, and that makes us question certain things, and, you know, the, the struggle that sometimes that, that can prevent. Well, I'll tell a story about something Sandy and I were both involved in. Um, we went to, uh, there was a show before COVID um, in BC uh, at the Driehaus Museum of Yinka Shonabare, who is Nigerian, right? Nigerian artist, um, I think. Uh, installation and fiber ceramics based artist, brilliant, brilliant, and disabled. And one of my personal go-to stellar artists right now, I look at him a lot. And so there was a show at the Dree House and then there was going to be a discussion of Yinka Shonabari um, at the MCA with uh, the curator from the Dree House and then a couple from the MCA. And Sandy and I and a couple of our, th our friends went to it. And the discussion was both, both left his disability out of the room, but then when they got around to it, the way, the, the comment I really remember is that they were talking about the fact that Shonabari works with a crew. And the Dree House curator said, he is forced to work with a crew because of his disability. Now, almost every artist these days working on large scale works with a crew, but they constructed his use of a crew as uh, something slightly pathetic and that surely he wouldn't have to do that if he was able-bodied. And by the time they ended up finishing talking, we were in tears and enraged. And when the Q&A started, we all were standing up and just saying, what are you doing? Like, you know, I mean, people know me in that crowd and they probably know Sandy too. So if I'm getting pissed off at MCA curators, I'm burning some bridges, you know? Like they may never think of me ever for, for anything, um, but I was so angry. It was more important to me, to, to us, to point out to that audience what was going on that certainly nobody else addressed until we did. And then when we did, all these other people were right standing up and raising their hands and talking about the ableism in the conversation, right? Is that what you remember too, Sandy? Is that there were comments like up from behind us and stuff, people I didn't know? A little bit, um, but I think what hurt from the conversation was, um, I think the curators or um, at least the speakers on stage was pointing out that, oh, we don't want to talk about his disability. Right. right. Yeah. Like, right. no, that would be like, that's something in private. Yeah, I think they say something in private. That's yeah, 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 yeah. They did. Yeah. And then right. we actually said that, well, you know, have you heard about the term disability aesthetics? It's a thing, you know, <laughs> and yeah. So it's, you know, fighting ableism, you, you can't stand on a roof and go, I shall fight ableism. It's something happens, right? Something happens and you make a decision about how you're gonna engage with the world or you have a feeling that's a bad feeling and maybe you're able to take it apart and say, oh, I'm feeling this way because of how I'm being treated or something that happened a year ago or 10 years ago or when I was a kid and I don't have to feel this way or at least I don't have to act on these feelings. But I always like to talk about I, I showed that portrait of Nomi Lamb. And many years ago when Nomi still lived here, she showed me an essay she wrote. She doesn't even remember it now. I asked her to send me a copy. She's like, I don't remember. But I think she wrote it when she was like 17. And the essay said that she had become really politicized and that she understood what was going on with ableism. 
But she wanted to say that doesn't mean it stops hurting. You can be as political as, you know, you, you can be a flaming torch. But when something happens or a bad memory happens, you have to forgive yourself if you're still hurt. If all of your sort of analysis and politics and aesthetics still aren't thick enough or established enough, whatever it is, for those things not to hurt. And I think that's true for a lot of us who are political because you know, if someone attacks your race, you may have as much race theory as you can possibly have, but maybe that little bit of pain is the, the molten, adds a little to the molten core. It's not that, oh, I'm not going to feel that. It's that, oh, right, this is painful, and that's why I have to fight this. This is Lisa. Um, I can't believe that we are basically at closing time and we, I know I feel like we should listen to you talk it would be an honor and privilege for another several hours but we are going to end on time um, and we are so so incredibly grateful to have both of you Riva and Sandy join us today um, I know you said Riva you can't see the chat but um, the the appreciation for all for both of you is so so strong, um, and we add us to the list of those that are grateful that you are in Chicago with us. Um, so thank you to all of you who joined us and supported this program. And as promised, we are giving away ten copies uh, graciously in connection uh, to Viva of Gollum Girl. So I will email you tomorrow. For you all who won, yes, Reva is proudly showing a cover of the book right now. And if your names are Steve Corey, uh, Mary Daniel, Jackie Maldonado, Ingrid Plow, David Gave, Cheryl Miller, Barbara Collis, Anne Scholhamer, and Amelia Brunskill, and Aislinn Ahern, again, I will email you tomorrow and we will get the book to you and so grateful to have you here. And before we conclude a few announcements here, and before we conclude a few announcements, if you would like to continue to see Disability Lead produce accessible events like these, please consider contributing to our program at disabilitylead.org backslash donate. And finally, please stay engaged with us, follow us on social media, we're on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn to learn more about our work and when we announce future events like these. Again, Riva, Sandy, we can't thank you enough for your time and your talent today and always. So have a good night, everyone. Thank you.